Fruitcake needs a rebrand. It needs a like really smart marketing person to give it a whole, give its image a makeover. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Saffitz. On today's episode of Try This At Home, I have a really special recipe to share with you. I'm so excited about it. This is my one day fruitcake. So you can make this from start to finish in an afternoon, and it really has all of the qualities of an aged fruitcake. Incredibly complex flavor, packed with fruit, not too sweet, and I think it could be like on everyone's holiday table this year. The first time I made fruitcake, I really wondered if I was doing something wrong because there was so much fruit, but that is what fruitcake is. It really is mostly dried fruit and it's kind of held together by the cake batter, but the focus is on the fruit. So I like a mix of stuff and I also like a mix of fruit that gives you some like complexity of flavor and a little bit of acid, a little bit of bitterness. So to that end, here's what I have. Dried apricots, prunes, then I have dried cherries, dried cranberries, and then I have dried currants, which for me is mostly a textural thing. I just really like how small they are. There's no raisins. Sorry, Vaughn. You could use whatever mix you prefer. If you want to swap in a different dried fruit or you don't like cranberries or whatever, that's fine. So the first step of the recipe, which you'll have to set up the day before, is to soak the fruit. Dried fruit is really, really high in sugar. It's very concentrated. And if you don't soak the fruit beforehand, which is like to add liquid to it, it will pull liquid from the cake and kind of dry everything out. The liquid that I'm using is orange juice and some dark rum. Really like the principal flavor of fruitcake besides dried fruit is alcohol. And you could use a variety of different alcohols. You could use bourbon, or another whiskey, brandy, a cognac, whatever you want. I'm using dark rum, which is pretty classic. So I'm using like a good quality dark rum. You want it to be aged. You could use a spiced rum if you want. So I'm just gonna combine everything in a bowl here. This is like a weird concept, but it should ideally be fresh dried fruit if that makes sense. As in dried fruit that is like not so old that it's become super, super hard. That said, when I was testing this recipe, I was in an area where I couldn't really access a lot of different grocery stores and I did have some like pretty old dried fruit around and it was totally fine. You can see that altogether, this is like quite a bit of dried fruit. But again, really the principal substance of fruitcake is fruit. Okay, then I'm gonna add my orange juice. I have a half a cup. I try to use like fresh squeezed orange juice. Then I have a half cup of, in this case, dark rum. Again, you could use any type of aged alcohol that you like. And this is quite a bit of liquid. But what's gonna happen as this sits is the fruit is going to hydrate, it's going to absorb the liquid and soften. And of course, it's gonna like pull in all that flavor also. So it already smells so good. Rum is, <laughs> I feel this way about like most aged alcohol. I love the smell but I don't really ever want to drink it. Okay, so this is well combined. I'm gonna cover it really tightly. I want it to be airtight because I want the fruit to absorb all the liquid and I don't want it to evaporate. So this sits between 12 and 24 hours. You want the fruit to have a chance to soften. Do though like check on it and give it a stir once or twice during that time just so the fruit that's on top has a chance to get on the bottom where the liquid is. This is a version from yesterday. So we set this up last night. And you can see that the fruit, it's like so glossy and pretty. It's really plumped up and there's almost no standing liquid in the bottom. The other main component of fruitcake is toasted nuts. So I'm using walnuts because I like that they have this sort of subtle bitterness to them. You could also use pecans, which sort of don't have that. It's really up to you, but I really love walnuts. So these I just toasted in a 350 oven for about 10 minutes until they were kind of golden and like super fragrant. So mostly it's your nose that will tell you if they're done. And I like to do it in the oven. I've seen people toast nuts on the stovetop, but one, I think they burn really easily, and two, they don't like toast all the way through. So an oven is good for that. And you can use walnut pieces or halves, like halves are more expensive because you're chopping it up anyway. It really doesn't matter. And I'm just chopping it up until they're about the same size as the fruit pieces. So this is just pretty coarse. Again, I just think it's like a really important textural and flavor component, and it really does help to counter a lot of the sweetness. When you're chopping nuts, you almost always get like dusty nut pieces like this. One thing you can do is kind of like toss them and then if you see bigger pieces, just move them over to one side and just chop those. So I have my fruit and nut mixture. Those are all of like the mix-ins or inclusions in the fruit cake. And now I'm gonna prepare the pan, which I wanna do before I start baking, which is a really important step. Okay, so here I have a 12 cup bunt pan. This is like the classic bunt pan. If you go into a store and they have one bunt pan, this is the one it's gonna be. Now this is great actually for fruitcake for a couple reasons. One is like looks very festive and that's always fun. Two, that tube in the center means that you have more surface area of the cake. 
so the cake bakes faster and more evenly. And that's important for fruit cake because it is a style of cake that's like pretty dense and also bakes for a very long time. So having that sort of heat transfer in the center just helps for even baking so you don't get like overcooked sides or underdone middle. So there is a risk of any bits of fruit kind of that are touching the pan to stick because of all that sugar. So we're gonna grease it very thoroughly. And I like to use room temperature butter. Butter, when it's room temperature, you can apply it in like a nice, thick, generous layer, as opposed to like an oil, which is just always a thin film. And I wanna really focus on coating every facet of the bunt pan, including the tube in the center, and especially getting down in those grooves because it's really in the area, this area of the pan, like the very top of the cake, where sticking occurs most frequently. Better to use more than less. But I wouldn't use like an oil spray because you're just not going to get a thick enough layer and the oil will pool and then you can't really flour it. The flour kind of beads up. So butter is the best tool here. Plus there's butter in the cake. Whatever my like fat is in the recipe is what I try to use for the pan. We're also going to glaze the top of the cake. So one thing that sometimes happens is if you have like a big layer of butter anywhere, the cake won't like fill in the contours of the pan and you might have you know, like some little indentations, but it's not that big of a deal because we're gonna add a glaze anyway. I took my time and I have a really nice, even, pretty thick, generous layer of butter all over the pan. Now I'm going to add my flour. And sometimes I like throw it against the tube part a little bit. So now I'm gonna just tap the pan all around in every direction. So this is like a very nicely coated, greased, buttered and floured bun pan. So I want to talk about the ingredients in the rest of the fruitcake, the ingredients besides the nuts and fruit. This is really an American adaptation of the classic British fruitcake, which would have like treacle or sometimes like, you know, golden syrup, those kind of molassesy products. It usually has candied peel. It's actually a really hard product to find in the US and sometimes it's not of the highest quality. So rather than adding candied peel, I add some citrus zest to the batter. I'm not adding molasses to this, but I'm using dark brown sugar, which has molasses added to it for that flavor. Butter and almond paste, those are kind of like my fat sources. Ground ginger, I have ground allspice, and just a pinch of ground cloves. This is also a really egg, eggy, egg-rich recipe, and the eggs also further add like richness and a kind of like preserved quality to the cake. So I'm just using all-purpose flour, and you'll notice that like it doesn't make a huge amount of batter. I'm mixing the batter with like almost equal parts dried fruit and nuts. So I have my clove, allspice, ground ginger. You could use like pumpkin pie spice mix if you like that. Add some nutmeg, it's up to you. Then I have some baking soda and baking powder. It's not a lot of leavener for the amount of batter because fruitcake is not a light, bouncy crumb. It is a denser cake. Then I have kosher salt. What I find is so often missing from baking recipes is the right amount of salt. So I'm gonna add that in. I love allspice. Allspice, I feel like, is an underrated warm spice. And cloves, too. Cloves, I think so many people, without knowing, like, being able to identify it, like, associate cloves with the smell of the holidays. It's, like, in mold spirits and that kind of thing. But a little bit goes a long way. I'm gonna start the batter by zesting my citrus. I have an orange and a couple lemons. Again, this is to kind of replace the flavor of, like, candied peel. Orange is a really powerful flavor. So I like to be cautious when I use it, but I really, I like it at the same time. But it's that mix of like orange with the brown sugar, with the almond, with all the fruits. It all kind of like becomes really harmonious and blends together and it just equals Christmas flavor. <laughs> it's just the flavor of Christmas. Okay, so now I'm gonna add my almond paste. So your almond paste should ideally have like a softness and almost wetness to it. it should be really malleable to get the almond paste broken down and to get it to blend into the batter, I just crumble it into the bowl. Almond paste is not the same thing as marzipan. There is a difference. So almond paste is a smooth paste of ground almonds and sugar. And it differs from marzipan because marzipan actually has more sugar. I still like marzipan, but almond paste is a more useful product in baking just because it has less sugar. Two sticks of butter. This is a high fat, high sugar, high egg recipe. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna start to Bring this together. So I'm gonna start this off on low speed. This thing is, this, this thing. So it's, it's struggling a little bit against all of the almond paste and the butter. 
but you just have to work all this together and then once it's well combined, I'll increase the speed and then we're gonna really start to kind of cream together the mixture. You could definitely use a stand mixer for this. I have a hand mixer just because, to me, like the way that I have my kitchen set up, it's like easier to pull out than my stand mixer and it feels really accessible, but absolutely throw everything in your stand mixer and put the paddle on. So it's already paled, I would say, a shade or two, like the color has gone lighter. I would say this is pretty light and fluffy. Again, not as like pale or fluffy as I would want it to be if I were making just like a butter cake, but we're not going for a lot of um, what we call mechanical leavening here, which is air worked into the mixture. So now I'm gonna add the eggs just and scrape down the sides really well. Because of the density of the batter, it's easy to have you know, some like trapped butter around the sides. And you want them to be room temperature because the butter is room temperature, and if you add cold eggs to room temp butter, it causes the butter to firm up, and then you sort of lose that texture and also like the emulsifying of the eggs and the butter together. So just one at a time. And then I'm gonna beat in between additions until the mixture is smooth. This is the mixture with all of the eggs added. It's really creamy and smooth and still nice and fluffy. I'm going to add the dry ingredients now, just all in one shot, and then I'm gonna mix just on low speed until the flour disappears and I have an evenly mixed batter. It's gonna be really thick. I'm not adding a liquid ingredient. Often in a cake recipe, you'll see like, add the, the liquid and the dry ingredients alternating. I don't have any liquid ingredients. I actually did already add the liquid. The liquid is in my fruit. I added that rum and orange juice. So you can see I have this really thick batter. It's nice and evenly mixed. And now I, when I use a hand mixer or a stand mixer, I like to mix until the flour disappears, but then I do the final mix by hand. See, I have a lot of flour trapped around the sides here. Here's my batter and here's my fruit and nut mixture. It's like the same quantities. Just as much fruit almost as there is batter. And so that's what fruitcake is. It is a very fruit and nut heavy cake. And if you have any liquid remaining in your fruit, tip that in as well. Just add everything. If you have really soft fruit, you'll notice that maybe it started to like break down a little bit. That's totally fine. That's actually good. You know, then it's gonna almost be seamlessly integrated into the cake. And if you have any liquid, like the batter is gonna absorb that. And you might have like pockets of fruit that hasn't been mixed in. So go ahead and scrape the bottom and sides. Make sure you don't have any big unmixed areas. It's a lot of batter. My hand hurts a little bit from stirring this. I still have a fruit cake at home, like a, like an aged fruit cake from two and a half years ago. I've never cut into. Still good, allegedly. We'll find out this Christmas. The batter is mixed. The fruit is incorporated. And now I'm gonna fill the pan. This is a really thick batter, so one of the things you wanna just be on the lookout for when you go to fill the pan is like you don't wanna make big air pockets. And you wanna make sure that the batter is in contact with the pan on every little surface so that you get that definition from the bun pan. So I like to sort of scoop dollops of batter into the bottom. So once you have some of the batter dolloped into the very bottom, I like to just drag my spatula across it and kind of press it down to make sure it just fills out all of those little areas and I don't have any gaps. Okay, and then you can add the rest. Again, try not to make any big air pockets. It weighs a ton, really. <laughs> it's a very heavy batter. Now I just wanna smooth the top. You can see that this is a lot of batter. It's a big cake and it's gonna bake for a long time. So especially given the density of everything, it takes a while for the center to really cook through. We're gonna bake this at a pretty low temperature for a cake, 325. And that just means that the center will have time to bake through before the edges overcook. And again, it's a great application for a bunt pan because you have heat coming to the cake from the center. So it just bakes more evenly this way. So into your 325 oven. The cake should be risen, and I'm gonna use the cake tester and I'm gonna insert it into the tallest part of the cake, all the way down to the center, and it should come out clean. I have just the tiniest moist crumbs on here, so this is done. This comes out. This thing weighs a ton. <laughs> it's really a heavy cake. Okay. 
in traditional fruitcake, you do something called feed it. You pour or brush a little bit of alcohol over the surface of the cake and you have like holes poked in it. The fruit absorbs it. It becomes basically preserved in whatever booze you're using. So we're not doing that here. We are not doing a eight week fruitcake. We're doing a one day fruitcake. I'm just going to soak it you know, out of the oven with a little bit of rum. So 15 minutes later, we're ready to soak the cake. So the first thing I wanna do is just poke holes all across the surface. This is gonna create little entry points for the rum to absorb into the crumb. So dozens of little holes all over. Toothpick is, works fine for this. Can I tell you, Harris gave me the biggest compliment he's ever given me about a recipe about this cake. And he told me that it tastes like it comes from a place in England that's been making it for 200 years. And I was like, that's truly the nicest thing you've ever said to me about anything, much less a recipe. I was extremely flattered. I have my pastry brush and the rum. And this amount of rum, this third of a cup, is for doing the entire cake. So I'm not gonna like add an excessive amount here. So you wanna soak the cake while it's warm because then it, it's like really receptive to the soak, um, but just not super hot because we're gonna then turn it out. So this looks good. I still have about a quarter cup left. So to turn out the cake, I know that I greased it really, really well. I did all the butter and flour, but just to make sure you can go around with like your toothpick, just kind of like poke it at a couple places to try to get it away from the pan. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it out onto a wire rack. So I think the gentlest way to do it is to invert your rack onto the pan and then turn them out together. No sticking, came out perfectly. I have minimal little flowery areas, but all of that will be taken care of by the glaze and the icing that we're gonna put on top. And I recommend using a dabbing motion more than a brushing motion, because brushing can, A, it can kind of get bristles in the surface of the cake, but it can also drag up some crumbs. Okay, right at this stage is when I wanna move on to glazing. So the idea of the glaze is that it acts as this like sealant. It is like a shellac around the cake. So it's keeping in all that moisture, all that rum that we just soaked in with it and preventing moisture loss. Apricot jam is kind of like the go-to for glazes because it has, it kind of gives everything like a rosy color and the flavor is neutral enough that it goes with anything. I just wanna warm it up on the stove top until it's fluid. And then I have just like a little mesh strainer here. And whenever I strain jam, I always just put the strain solids like back in the jam jar because I like the fruit pieces, you know, on my toast. So this is nice and warm. And you would want it warm because you need it to sort of slide over the cake in a smooth layer. A flexible spatula is good for straining it because you can use it to press the solids against the strainer and extract all of the liquid. Now I'm gonna take the jam while it's still nice and fluid and just paint an even layer across the cake. This is where things get really, really pretty. What's great about using the jam as a glaze is that it plugs in any little like air bubbles that you have in the surface and seals them off so you get a smooth finish on the final cake. Make sure you get down in the middle of the cake in the center and you cover every surface. I mean, obviously not covering the bottom. Looks so beautiful, so festive, so Christmassy. And now the final step is to add the icing. Now, I just wanna wait for this to be fully cool before I do that. So not only do I not want there to be any heat inside the cake, but I want this surface to have a chance to basically like set. Because if I were to add the icing at this step, the jam is still a little bit slippery and the icing will just like fall right off. And I want it to have a nice tacky surface so that I have beautiful drips of icing at the very end. And now I'm gonna make the icing, which is incredibly simple and basic. I have powdered sugar here, a cup and a half. I'm adding just a pinch of salt. Then it's really a milk-based glaze, but I also add just a little bit of lemon juice because the lemon juice to me tends to take out a little bit of that like starchy flavor of powdered sugar. I want the icing to be really thick. 
it should fall off the whisk in like an unbroken trail, but then settle on the on top of the surface and take a little bit to settle in. So it creates a little bit of a ribbon on the surface. So this looks great. And I'm just gonna grab a spatula and we are going to put on the icing. When I am putting on the icing, I like to pour in a strip sort of along the tallest part of the cake and let it naturally sort of fall down the sides. So once you've poured all the icing on, you can use like the back of a spoon, I'm just using a little spatula here, to negotiate the icing around the cake and to get it to sort of drip down the sides the way you want it to. And it will set quickly, this is a pretty thick icing, so you don't have like a ton of work time. It's like a little snow-capped mountain kind of look. So this looks beautiful, and I'm just gonna wait to slice it until the icing is totally set. Okay, she's ready. The glaze is set, the icing is set. There is something about like that really white icing on the shiny, dark cake that looks so appealing. I just really wanna eat it. And I'm excited to show you the interior because it's like studded all over with the little pieces of dried fruit. Obviously tons of fruit. It almost has like a terrazzo look. Little stones set in like a base. It smells so good and it's not like you can pick out any one smell. It's not like I smell it and I'm like, Oh, that's ginger. Everything blends together in this really satisfying way and the flavors just kind of like blend together harmoniously and it's so yummy. And because the cake is not overly sweet, my favorite parts of the cake are the parts with the icing on top. It's like really tender and it has a slight crumbliness to it, but it's not dry. You get the richness from the almond paste. I love when you can eat cake this way by just pressing down on the crumbs and like picking them up with the fork that way rather than stabbing. That to me is like the sign of like a cake that's the texture that I want to eat. The fruit itself stays a little bit boozy. The flavor all around is just like really round and robust. I really think that we're gonna bring fruitcake back. I think this will rehabilitate fruitcake in your mind if you're someone who thinks that fruitcake is like a free weight, basically. But it's really not that at all. Like use good quality dried fruit, use a good quality alcohol, and you will have a delicious cake. And it really does perform in the way that a fruitcake performs. I love this recipe so much. I will 100% be making this for my holiday this year. My mom literally made one today. She like texted me while I was here being like, it's in the oven. I'll call her. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you, but I'm in the middle of playing cards. Oh, you're playing cards. I'm shooting, mom, look what I made. I know, I know. But I didn't fit it, I didn't do my glaze yet. It's not, I'm waiting for it to cool. Yeah, they're following the recipe. Well, I'm glad you figured out when to add the walnuts, but I'm shooting with New York Times. Look, say hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to cards, sorry. Bye. She plays Canasta online with her, with, with her, with her friends, yeah. <laughs> It's already, it's already catching like wildfire around here. So I really love showing it to you today. Thank you for watching. Try this at home. <laughs>